Hello and welcome to this uh, video on uh, app installation under the uh, Linux system. Uh, in uh, in this video, we're going to go over a little bit about the um, how to do how to install applications, some of the different methods of doing it. Uh, how we're going to talk a bit about RPMs and the RPM application as well as the RPM RUM. Uh, it's correction the uh, the YUM application. And we're going to talk a bit about repositories, getting getting software from the internet, and uh, we're going to finish it up with uh, kicking off a system update and show you how to do that. So for the purpose of this, we're going to um, take off where we left off with the, on the last uh, video with our, our Linux disk desktop system. In this case, I have actually switched it over from the virtual box we were using before to the KVM virtual machine. Um, you probably won't notice any difference from from uh, watching the interface. It's uh, pretty much the same as, or well, it'll it'll all be identical. It's only the um, the back end and also my ability to copy and paste text into here, which is um, a, a big help. Uh, from here, we're going to start looking at the command line a little bit, a little bit more. Um, haven't really touched on it in the past video, so for this, the, the two main applications, that you're gonna, or the two main commands that everyone's going to need to know a bit about are CD and LS to start off with. We'll go through more in depth in, in later videos, but right now CD is changing directories and LS is listing what's in the current directory. So if I do LS in here, you can see the directories there, and that corresponds with what's in this uh, home directory here. So you can see that I'm currently in my home directory. If I was to go see the downloads, I'm now in this directory but there's nothing there so if I do ls it doesn't show anything. Uh, this will become important in a minute but first thing we're going to do is, uh, so I'll look at installing two applications. First one will be uh, Google Chrome and the second one will be VLC for watching videos and, and that sort of thing. Just because um, the first time people usually install Linux, they go to install some sort of application, but without any idea how to do it and without any understanding of what an RPM is or what um, how you know package management systems work or anything like that, they usually go and download the source code or some sort of random binaries and, and try and run it and think that it's all pretty hard. I remember that's how I did it the first time I tried to run uh, Apache on a Linux system is <coughs> when download the source code and compiled it, which um, isn't the most user-friendly way of uh, of getting it on a new system. So first thing we're going to do, Firefox is built in. Um, a lot of people prefer Chrome though, it's a bit, bit snappier usually and, and better for watching videos and uh, Flash and other bits and pieces if you need that. So we'll go, just open this up, default to this is your home screen, we'll just go Google Chrome. And go here shall we? download Chrome. Now it's recognized that this is actually a Linux box. Um, it's part of the user agent string that gets sent to the website you're going to, identifying what, what uh, operating system you're running on and, and that sort of thing. It's realized that. So the, the two main uh, package types are the deb package type for as a Debian Ubuntu type operating systems or the RPM for Fedora, OpenSUSE, uh, CentOS and Red Hat fit into there as well. So we're going to do that. Click on the 64-bit RPM Got the terms and conditions, and you go accept and install, and it'll try and it'll start downloading it. Now, I usually like to click on save. You can install it with the software graphical user interface uh, on here. There's a, a um, it'll go through and install, but we want to see a little bit more about what it's doing and how to do that. So, I'll save the file, and this will be the first thing we install. Now, the first thing that people usually use is uh, they attempt to just straight up install the RPM file, you can see it's in the downloads file, folder now, where it wasn't before, I'll just click over here, you can see that's the same file there. Um, now there's two applications, RPM is for dealing with these RPM files, RPM is Red Hat Package Management. Um, an RPM file is essentially a zip file with a bit of a, a manifest that tells the, uh, the RPM installer where the files inside the zip file go on the operating system and it has uh, a bit about other files that get created as part of the process like config files and where the log files go and all that sort of thing. It also has usually post install, uh, uh, pre-install and post-install scripts and pre-uninstall and pre -un and post-uninstall scripts. So these usually run at the beginning to set up other bits and pieces on the operating system. 
uh, first thing I'll do is I'll just uh, switch to root. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can do su dash uh, that switches to the well, some su. Some people say switch user. Some people say super user. But it basically switches you to root unless you put in a, a name here of um, of the user you want to switch to. Uh, alternatively, you can sudo, which is do as a super user, and dash i is interactively. And so, and depending, sudo will ask you for the user's password. Um, so if I do that as the user we set up before, I'm just going to grab the password from that. And that's. Saved it somewhere. There we go. Um, so the password for this user, stick that in there, and it says I'm not in the sudoers file. Okay. Uh, if you've got uh, alerting set up, I would usually send an email alert to someone saying somebody is, uh, has attempted to access this when if they're not in the sudoers file. That means I haven't been granted access to do that. So instead, I use the root one. Using this, switch to super user in the root password and the first thing I'll do is I'll run via sudo and this is one thing, something we'll cover later on and I'll put myself in the sudoers file so this is etc uh, slash etc slash sudoers um, I'll just go find down here we got this root is there to run sudoers and if I do this and type in now I am allowed to run sudoers as well so just to do that it, it's always brief preferable rather than using su dash and switching to root is to use sudo dash i if you can use sudo um, it uh, it actually it, it does more logging records who's switching in the, so there's audit logs and things like that on the system that record when security events and things like that happen like this is an elevation of privileges whereas the other one was switching to a different user and um, it's recorded differently this is a little bit nicer and this, this way you can grant users super user rights without telling them what the root password is. Uh, so anyway, now that I'm as root, I can... Uh, I'll have a look at a couple of things. So we'll go to home, uh, jrcock, and downloads. You can see the file there that we downloaded. And the first thing I'll do is just... I'll, I'll show you the man page. So, so man is a he um, brings up the manual for any given application or any given program. So man RPM, and you can see some of the things that RPM can be used for here. So this is querying the uh, and verifying packages. There's actually a database which keeps track of every package that was installed. You can see at the beginning when we were doing the installation in the past video, there's about 1300 uh, packages on a, uh, a graphical user interface type system. If we did the basic install without the graphical interface, it would be more like three or 400. Um, but you can see what you can do, use the RPM here to command to do things like query the database, look up information about existing packages, verify. So this will actually check a, a package and all the files associated with it, see if it's changed. You do install, upgrade, upgrade does some other thing to install usually. Uh, reinstall. So this is sometimes if, um, particularly if a kernel's uh, install is broken for whatever reason, sometimes if a, a machine bounces part way through. It doesn't do the uh, create some of the kernel modules and things properly and the machine won't boot into the latest kernel that it's got installed so you can do a reinstall on that and it'll regenerate all the, the bits that it needs to as part of the install process. Arrays will, will delete a uh, package and there's other things you can do like you go into this, the uh, query options you can do things, ch check the change log, you can see what's changed in the current version versus the previous versions you can do info, get a bit more information about it. There's um, things that you can look up what the pre and post scripts are related to a particular package. And um, there's, you can use it for sort of low level modifying of the uh, package database. Uh, so I'll just show you what happens if you try and install our package straight up with RPM. What I expect to happen now is this, uh, this oh, I don't have tab completion anymore. That's a bit frustrating. Anyway. Um, 
what I expect to happen is this this package will actually rely on other packages and there'll be dependencies that need to be met before this one can be installed. If I install this it'll probably give me a list of other packages that I need to install first. Uh, RPM I must have typed that in quickly. Uh, RPM dash I dash dash install straight up install. So it's gone through and it said here's a bunch of failed dependencies and this is the problem you get into uh, when you start playing around with this. You, you This is um, trying to sort these out and work out what the dependencies are you yourself is um, uh, you get to what's referred as dependency hell. So basically you find the packages that provide these and then you get a bunch more. So a long time ago when this started being a problem, when people started running into this, uh, a group in it with a software distribution called Yellow Dog, which isn't around anymore, uh, produce what's called Yellow Dog Update Manager, or YUM for short. And YUM basically uh, sets up a allows a bunch of um, installation sources where it can actually go out. It'll look at the package, look at the dependencies, and then it'll go out and get other packages as required to in order to install it. So if I go yum install you know, dot slash dot slash just means current directory Google Chrome. It, you can see it'll go out and it'll find the packages that provide these and also find the packages that these depend on. And you can see that uh, here's a bunch of other packages that are required before it'll, it can install Google Chrome. Uh, so I'll just say no for this which is it's going to download 4 meg and do it then to 25 and uh, what I'll find, first of all I'll show you where it's getting these from you can see it's getting them from AppStream and BaseOS here so if I do yum repo list these are the places where, these are the repositories that are set up at the moment so you can see there's there's three of them here there's BaseOS, this is the original base operating system install um, package set uh, there's AppStream, where it's uh, there's kind of like it used to be called updates, but it's um, this is where you're getting uh, new versions of all the applications that are coming in, or new new packages and extras is uh, another one I've currently got set up, and you can see where they configure this because uh, most of the configuration files are all text files that you can go and look up. If you go into slash etc, etc is where a lot of the system configuration files are kept. Yum dot repos dot d and we have a look in here, you can see there's a bunch of files here that have um, included by the operating system and so if I just uh, just cat this one, uh, cat is short for concatenate and it just throws, if you cat a bunch of files it'll just throw all the, the contents of them at the, the screen unless you redirect it into a file anyway cat, I'll just cat this file so you can see what's in it and you can see it's got a, uh, and it's sort of a um, like that's like a index label. Then you've got the name of the of the repository. So CentOS release version base. This is coming in base OS here. And then it's the name. So you got the repo ID, repo name. So that's repo ID, repo name. A uh, mirror list is actually where it'll go out and find a list of mirrors where the files it needs are stored. Uh, the alternative to mirror list is base URL. So if you've only got a single host you're getting it from, it says go out and find it there. So the for this, for large operating systems like this, they'll, they'll have you know, hundreds, possibly thousands of of mirrors of the uh, software out on the internet. So you'll, it'll try and find the one closest to you and download from there. GPG check is if it checks the uh, certificates of the files to make sure that they're they're um, valid against the the certificates that it, it's um, the keys that it's got uh, recorded somewhere. Enabled, whether or not it's enabled by default, you can see this one is because it appears in the list there. If I change this to zero here, it'll disappear out of this list. And GPG key is basically the file where the key uh, for it to use for cryptographically check the packages when they're coming down, make sure they're allowed. So what I'll do here is I'll go back to um, downloads directory, cd dash just goes to the last directory you're in, and we'll do yum install uh, just copy and paste that. this time we'll hit yes and you can watch it goes out and gets the uh, all those packages installs them now it's saying 
because this one uh, this is the first time we've uh, done the installation from these and it's asking if we accept this key uh, it hasn't been important, imported yet but it's the one that came with the um, as part of the default repository so you're pretty safe at accepting this one So in this step up here, I actually went and grabbed the files. Now it's grabbed them. It's gone to install the first one. Found that the um, it didn't have the, the key imported, so it asks you if you want to import it. And then it goes through and uh, installs all the the packages. With this one here being the one we actually told it to. So it's thrown a couple of errors here, but it's just continued in anyway. So those that clearly weren't a problem for it and <coughs> what we'll do now is if we do a yum oh, first of all I'll show you in the system here if I type in Chrome Chrome is now an application that's available so I'll just throw it into our favourites we've just installed it and we can start using that as our web browser but what we'll do instead first is we we'll go yum repo list again <coughs> Now I can see another repository has appeared into the list. Someone has gone and thrown in this one. So part of that package install is it's gone and created this Google Chrome repository which can, which has three packages in it. And if I go back to this yum, etc yum.repos.d and do an analysis in this directory, we've now got Google Chrome has appeared in the list. And so what this means is that in future if you do a yum update or you know go to apply operating system packages it'll actually pull down the um, latest versions of Chrome as part of that process uh, next what we'll do is we'll look at a couple of other repositories that we want to set up so as I said I'll get to VLC but we'll get there eventually um, the CentOS ones that are installed by default are all provided by the CentOS organization the um, Red Hat and Fedora provide an extra group of packages called Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux or EPEL for short that's what everyone usually calls it and you can see it comes from the Fedora project website you go there and they usually have instructions on how to go about installing it so this is, this is uh, if you're running uh, RHEL or CentOS 8 you go here and you run this command so this is yum install and because you've got the full URL there it'll actually go out to the internet yum will go out to the internet and get it for you provide you're connected to the internet. So we'll try that. Extra package for Enterprise Linux are free and open source software only that um, is, isn't encumbered by patents or anything like that but it, it has some extra software that wouldn't normally be included in a straight CentOS or a RHEL build. So if we do that, find it'll actually go out, get the uh, EPL release package so this actually sets up all the repositories for EPL <coughs> and we go yes on that one and now if I go yum repo list it again and it'll go out and then so what it's doing now is going to the EPL repository and finding any EPL packages that are out there so it's saying EPL is here and that has an extra nearly 3,000 packages that aren't included in the base release. So uh, yeah, you can go and there's, there's usually a lot of things that are useful in there. It's often development tools and things that aren't included uh, by default in the uh, operating system um, packages. Some of them, if you've if you've paid for a Red Hat subscription, you'll get access to them, but they're not included by default. So uh, it's it's good if you're using an unsupported. Uh, system or if you're using CentOS or something like that you can go out and get them there. So I said the uh, next thing we're going to install is VLC. Now VLC is it, it includes codecs for video, uh, playing back videos and, and mp3s and sound and audio and all that sort of thing and as such it is actually whether it's free and open source it is actually patent incumbent so it won't be included in EPEL but there is another relatively uh, trustworthy installation source called RPM Fusion that, that um, I've been using it for years before RPM before it was called RPM Fusion it was called RPM Forge um, and 
go out there and we can we can set up the install repositories for that. That's where we can find the uh, the VLC installation. There's also there's a lot of others um, other software in there. They've got um, they've got two repositories usually. There's the free and the not so free one. So free and non-free. And if we go for the It's usually a command line. CentOS 8 requires an additional CentOS step. Yeah, so we've got to enable something called Power Tools in there. Oh, that's, so that's after saying you've got to install EPEL first, which we've already done. And then you can go and get the RPM Fusion install for both the free and the non free version. So it's the two packages. Uh, this has got DNF there instead of yum, you'll notice. Uh, DNF has come in in later versions of Fedora and now it's in uh, CentOS 8 and uh, RHEL 8. And if you check DNF man page you see it's actually, it's, DNF stands for dandified yum. So it's actually a newer version of, of yum, it's basically the same thing, but they, they've got aliases in there so if you run DNF or if, if you run yum it'll do the same thing. Uh, I, Still often use uh, Yum for for CentOS and for Red Hat because uh, I manage everything from Red Hat 4 in some obscure cases all the way through to Red Hat 8, and so it's um, for the most part they, they just use Yum. Uh, so we'll do this. No GPG check tells it not to check the the um, for a GPG key on this package. It's uh, being that RPM Fusion is relatively safe, you can sort of pretty well get away with it. But, um, I wouldn't do this in a commercial environment. So this goes out and sets up the repositories for these two. Get that. It's asking if we really want to. You said yes. And now if I do a yum repo list. can see it's added even more. RPM Fusion free and non-free. And you can see there's a bunch of packages in each one. So if I do a yum info, um, once again all these yum commands I'm using are in the yum man page. You should always check man and then a command to find out more about it. This actually is pretty detailed documentation about all the different options that are in there. And it's just using the page up and page down keys to scroll backwards and forwards through it. And what you usually find is at the end of these com these uh, pages, there's usually examples, and then there's uh, files associated with the program, and there's also C also. So this is where you can go and look for more information about whatever it is you're looking up. So if I go yum info VLC, so I know that the package is called VLC. If I didn't know what it was called, you can uh, you can search for it with things like yum search VLC. It looks for anything that has VLC in either the uh, matching in the name, so this is here's one that matched exactly the name and here's some that had VLC in the uh, in the name or summary. In this case, uh, yeah, had a bit of both. So if you go yum install VLC now, we'll probably try and pull in some of those extra packages that are found. Gee put in a few more. These are some extra things. You can see where it came from. How RPM free, RPM Fusion free gets uh, VLC comes from there as well as some of the other things that VLC are dependent on. Uh, some of these packages here do things like FF, uh, MPEG I've used quite a bit for um, converting video files from one format to another or stripping out the audio. Uh, MPEG, you know, these are mostly codecs. It looks like VLC cores probably bits of the application. But you can see that it's pulled in a bunch of packages here from EPEL as well that are required. So these are just libraries that are dependent on things that the, um, the binaries would be compiled against. And then you've got some more in BaseOS and AppStream coming in here. GCC is a C compiler so it's obviously needs that for something. Um, go yes on that one. You can see most of these packages are pretty small. You can see the majority of packages on a Red Hat system are usually less than um, less than about 500k, 
you get a few big ones here and there, like here, 10 meg here for VLC core. Uh, usually the kernel is pretty big. LibreOffice is one of the larger ones you'll find uh, that's part of the uh, default operating system set. It's usually a few hundred meg. And you can see it's pretty quick to pull all these packages down because they're tiny. And once again, it's asking us because it hasn't imported the EPL key yet. This is the first time we're installing applications from EPL, saying, "Do you really want to install this? Allow this key?" Uh, we'll say yes. And this is for the RPM Fusion Free. And yes again. Now it's done that. It does a transaction test, so it basically goes through and has has a look at all the packages that are listed there, and and tries to tell what will happen if you install them. And that's the point at which it it works out. Uh, conflicts between different packages, so sometimes if you've got different versions of the same package, like you might have two versions of Python or something, or two versions of some programming language, uh, the, the files in the libraries might actually conflict with one another and it'll tell you about it here. Uh, sometimes if you've got the 32-bit uh, and 64-bit versions of the same program might conflict, but uh, usually if they're, if they're put together properly they'll be in different locations. Different, like under the lib folder versus the lib64 folder. Right, that was pretty quick, and there we go. Now we've got access to VLC. Um, I'll just load it up there. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, watch videos now. Right, so what we'll do now is we'll have a look at the RPM database a little bit, so particularly related to VLC. So we just did a uh, dash or dash Q queries the database, so dash A is query for all. So this actually will show a list of all packages that are installed on the system. And you, as you can see, there's quite a lot. If I feed it through WC, WC is word count and dash L is for checking the number of lines rather than individual words, you can see that there are currently 1400 packages, which lines up, there was about 1300 to begin with, plus we've installed maybe 100 through these uh, dependencies for these two applications. You can see there's quite a lot of them there. Uh, what we can do then is looking at individual packages, so we've just installed VLC, so if, if we go uh, I'll use a grep command here, I haven't used that one yet in this video series, but grep allows you, it's a global regular expression parser. You can pipe things through it and you can tell it to, so if I pipe uh, a pipe here, will actually feed the text from one, one command into another command. So the, the text that came out of here, that's this all this text here, uh, I'll pipe it into grep and we'll grep for VLC. So what this will do is go through the RPM database, query, get a list of all packages and then I only want to see the ones that actually have VLC in the name. And there we go. So this is the VLC package complete with version information and we'll do a query dash info on that and it tells us a little bit about the package itself, so the name, so about the, the version releases of it. Uh, you can see it was produced for Enterprise Linux 8. Uh, so 64-bit application when it was installed. Uh, groups, so you can have you can have application groups and things in different versions of the operating system. What the source RPM it was uh, installed from is called. And so if you go out and try and install that, you can actually download the source code for it. Uh, when it was built, so this was built on the 25th of October, not too long ago, and it was built on this is the name of the host. So it's an RPM Fusion box where this was actually converted from source code into a, a RPM package to, for me to download, com compile the binaries, completed, uh, and uh, put together. Packager is packaged by RPM Fusion, vendor RPM Fusion. URL, that's uh, where you go to get the, the actual uh, application itself, and a little bit about it. You can see it's got a bit of a description there about it. So some more information we can pull out of it than that. If you do a q-l, q-l, uh, this will actually list all the files that are installed as part of it. So this is, if you have a look through around the operating system, you can see these are some of the the, um, 
the library files here, the installation binaries up there. Here's some documentation that is associated with it. Here's a readme file here, Let's see what that says. Here we go, a little bit about the um, links where you can get information about it. You can, yeah, yeah, about the files there. Um, you can do a other things you can query. A list of files you can query. Uh, scripts and these are the install scripts. So you can see post install. This is what is actually run by the uh, by RPM after the package is installed. You can say it generates a cache of some kind. It touches this file. It then a uh, touch just it creates an empty file, or updates the date and time on a on a old file if it exists. If it just changes the modified time without actually changing the contents. Uh, if X is if this exists, uh, X is it exists or executable, then do this. Uh, update icon cache. Update desktop database. So this is actually throwing the um, putting together the this uh, this actual icon, putting it into your ability to run this as a desktop application, um, and then find it easily. Yeah, some other bits and pieces that it does post install, and we can also look at the change log as well for see what's happened in different versions. So for this, I'll just pipe it through. Uh, less. This will um, allow us to browse through it and start at the top because otherwise it'll just throw up hundreds of pages. So we can see the thing that got changed in October when it was rebuilt last is that rebuild for David surname bump. I don't really know what that means. Somebody wanted a rebuild. October 14th you can say update mammal patch to 10. You can, ah here we go. This is the point where it was added to EL8 support. And you can go through. Uh, where this is useful is things like um, you can you can often have a look if there's an application that had a bug or a security issue associated with it. You can have a look through and see when that was resolved or if it was resolved. So often, if a if a CVE is come out, CVE is a um, <coughs> like a vulnerability notice for a, a bit of software. Uh, if if a CVE is CVE is come out and a new package comes out. The um, packages don't always address the existing CVEs, and sometimes they can be open for a long time. And it's worthwhile uh, checking using this to see if the CVE number is mentioned in the uh, change log. And try and find an example of that is if we do RPM QL, uh, dash QL is the same as dash Q dash L. And check the. the uh, Kernel information, the kernel file there, and if I'll just go uh, rpm dash q dash dash change log. Let's spell it correctly. Kernel and pop it through less because that's what happens. We can see uh, rolled in, sent to a secure boot, applied running, revert this. And if we have a look through here, they usually find some got some bug numbers and things like that in here when when uh, when something's been fixed. But you might find. Oops, CVE. CVE. Here we go. So this is a, a CVE number that um, a known vulnerability, and this is where they've actually fixed this so crypto set SK to null when that is that. It's uh, don't worry. This uh, these command these comments all mean something to somebody. Some of them are straightforward. Some of them you've got to know a little bit more about the system before you understand what they're talking about. Right. So that is um, a little bit about RPM and Yum. I'll go through. There's there's more details to include uh, later in uh, later videos when we go about creating our own repository, showing how to put together RPMs and things. There'll be I'll probably do a video on uh, actually building an RPM file from source and we'll go through 
uh, creating your own repositories so you can download packages from external sources and create your own repository and uh, we'll also look at Uh, that that'll probably do for the time being. I uh, probably yeah uh, yeah I'll I'll do a package on um, a video on doing installation update baselines. So if you're keeping your development environments and test environments at a certain level and keeping your production environments at another level, so you can actually roll through uh, patching production before you pack uh, correction patching dev test before you patch production. So you make sure that when you do patch production. It, brings it up to the same level as dev test with, with tested patches only before rolling on to um, you know the latest and greatest. But what I'll do now is I'll do if I do yum in, uh, check update this is a nice little command that you can run to check if there are any updates and as you can see there are there's probably quite a few. There you go since it's uh, this is a just a CentOS 8 flat and this is all the applications and packages that have been updated since then. So if I do you do him update and this will go out and it'll ask us if we want to do this. So we'll say yes or no. In this case I'll say no but just so I can demonstrate what happens if you do dash Y this prevents you prevents it from asking you. So often on a desktop system like this I'll put a um, a cron entry in to Apply updates uh, at certain times. So, for example, on you know every night at midnight or something like that, I might say apply all outstanding updates. Um, wouldn't want to do that on a production system, but on desktop it's usually fine. Just keeps it up to date. And here we go. You can see it going out to the internet to uh, fetch all of these updates. You can see if we have a look up here. You can see it's installing per a kernel while the rest of them are updating. The reason is that uh, it doesn't actually get rid of the old kernel package. The idea being that if you, um, if the new kernel doesn't work for whatever reason, you've got drivers or something like that that aren't aren't um, fitting in there properly, and it's not allowing your system to actually boot up. You can boot up off the previous kernel with the uh, kernel modules and drivers and things that were associated with that previous version that you're known to work. And um, <coughs> fix whatever's wrong with the system. Here we go. That was relatively quick. And doing its transaction test like just like it did when it was doing the update. And any moment now I'll start throwing them on the There we go. So three hundred's not too bad for not too bad how, how many uh, actions it has to do. Usually the, the first half are installing or updating the packages that were installed and then there's usually a equal number of cleanup tasks afterwards to um, remove the old packages. And so that's why I like the... it says 330, uh, 344 there but the last 50% of those packages will... It, uh, steps it'll just fly through really quickly. So you can see it's running scripts that it, as it's doing the update. And just let this run through for a little bit. And then once this is done, I'll just last step before we uh, end this video, I'll um, just show you the uh, Yum transaction logs. This is how you actually, if you're making changes to a production system, you'd always put in a, some sort of change control first. And for the for that, one of the steps in the change control is always detailing how you're going to back out the changes once you've. Uh, started doing this. In fact, that's something I, I should have I intended to do for this video before doing this, but um, uh, my approvers have all gone to bed, so I'll uh, I just went ahead with it in this case. Being a desktop system, it's usually fine, but you know, production server, you want to make sure that you've got had another set of eyes on it. Even if your company doesn't have a policy of of uh, requiring change control, it's always a good idea to do it yourself and just run a uh, get somebody to do a peer review for you before you hit the go on some major change. But um, in a change control, you usually want to include things like what the business case for what you're doing is. Like in this case, we're applying updates uh, to uh, enhance the security of the um, system to remove known bugs and uh, include enhancements. 
and you would include the impact. The impact of this is that we're going to have to reboot at the end, so everyone's going to be kicked off for a bit during the uh, reboot window. Uh, we've got what um, machine is going to be affected, which is just this one, JATCL8 desktop. And we've got uh, what our rollback procedure is going to be. So the rollback procedure in this case is going to be use yum to uh, roll back to a previous transaction. And uh, you, you'd have your outage window, start times, end times, all that sort of thing. Uh, how are you going to confirm that it has actually worked once it's done and who's going to do the confirmation? Um, those are the main things. Who's going to improve it? Here we go, we're just getting to the cleanup stage here. You can see this one shoots through pretty quickly. It's much faster than the actual install. It's um, clean up, it often doesn't have to do a great deal. Some of them have cleanup scripts as you can see, particularly the anything kernel related. This one's taking a while actually. It usually doesn't take that long on a clean up. You can minimise that, go and do something else for a bit. Um, if you try and I'll just show you what happens if you run up yum while somebody else is doing something. And just do a yum depot list. And ah, this must have finished. No, it's not it's allowing me to do it while this is running, it's not usual. Okay. There must be a new feature in the new latest version. Yum doesn't usually allow you to do two actions at once. Hmm. That's quite interesting. Anyway. Um, I don't really want to run two things at the same time as just testing that. Um, next thing we'll do though, while we're waiting for this, is just go through and check the man pages for yum and look at the transaction details. It's uh, yum history is the command I believe. Yum history or DNF history. Uh, so I'll run this one. How's that going? That's up to 344 or 344. Usually it takes a little while to do that, to once it's done the last step to actually come back and return. Yeah, it's running some post and tool scripts. What I'll do is just do yum history info. Here's all the yum transactions. Uh, everything that happened in this transaction, rather. Package is altered. So here's a transaction ID 6. Uh, it did this. Who did it? That was me. And if I do. Here's a list of the transactions. Okay, you can see it went through from 1 up to 6. You can see. Um, if I do info 5, that should return information about the VLC. So you can actually go through here and do, uh, there's, let's just go back and look at the history commands again. So you can do yum history, you can do redo, you can redo a specific transaction, so I'll actually go through and attempt the uh, the same thing again, that's often good if it's broken part way through, you can roll back, so you can actually say this particular transaction I want to undo that one, so when I install that program, but I want to leave the rest of the transactions as they are, 
uh, so this is uh, correction. This is rolling back to a particular one, whereas undo um, undoes a particular one. So yeah, that's uh, that's usually useful for your um, rollback plan. I do yum check update now. It should tell me there's no updates. If you do often it'll tell you if there's uh, if you're up to date but you're running an old version of the kernel. This version doesn't do that. But um yeah you can see we're running uh four dot eighteen dot zero dash eighty uh Uname tells you information about the running system. You can see it's got things like hostname in there and uh, when the kernel was built, this is what the kernel version is. So if I do rpm minus k grip kernel, you can see we're now running 4.18.0 dash 80 and then dot 11.2 L8, whereas this one's 80.el8, so this is an 11.2 uh, version update since then. Alright, um, so the next thing you do once you've done that is reboot the box because you are running a different kernel and we'll see what has. Notice how there's now a third option in there, or that previously there were only two. That is because the um, that, that's what the point at which you can run the previous kernel if you run into issues. So this reboot option is uh, step is always an important step of the update process to make sure that it actually comes up correctly afterwards. You don't want it to you don't want to be applying updates and not have the kernel applied and then find that in a month time or however long before uh, somebody reboots it the next time, then uh, everything goes wrong. And nobody knows why because it's been a long time since it was last updated. Uh, correction was last rebooted. Oh, here we are, back in our updated, patched desktop environment. So I will leave the video there, and um, we'll continue looking at uh, some of the applications and uh, some of the uh, things you need to do, maybe uh, some basic commands and how to find your way around in the next video.